Hi, my name is Beth Novak, and welcome. In an earlier module, we focused on the central skill of problem definition, the importance of articulating a clear, compelling, and specific definition of a problem and its root causes. As we said then, it is important to define the problem collaboratively. But how do we undertake such collaboration efficiently and effectively? How do we tap people's expertise, what we might call collective intelligence, both to define the problem and to devise innovative solutions? That's why today we look at how organizations are turning to new technology to create a conversation with a wider audience to tackle public problems more effectively and more legitimately. By the end of this training module, you should be able to first understand why and when it is crucial to use such collective intelligence to define and to solve public problems. Second, describe a range of methods by which collective intelligence is being used in the public sector, including open innovation, collaboration, and co-creation. Third, understand and apply the key considerations for designing an effective open innovation project. Fourth, anticipate and mitigate common pitfalls when using open innovation to solve a public problem. Okay, so using collective intelligence is not a new idea. We've been using such practices for a very long time. Back in 1795, for example, Napoleon wanted a way to better preserve the food that his troops needed to survive the long Russian winters where they fought. They couldn't rely on the local populations to feed them, and thus, they needed to carry their own food along. Napoleon put out a prize back challenge, offering a reward of 12,000 francs to improve upon food preservation methods. It took 15 years to get the solution that he wanted, but a confectioner by the name of Nicolas Francois Appert developed a method of heating and boiling and then sealing food in airtight containers. It's pretty much the same process that we use today for conserving canned goods. Collective intelligence describes how groups of people and machines assemble in ways that lead to advances in intelligence. Collective intelligence, as we discussed in our Introduction to New Technologies module, encompasses a broad range of practices and tools. These practices are also known in the business world as open innovation. And since that is a common term in widespread use, we want to make sure to mention it. In the late 1970s, Eric von Hippel from MIT put forward a new view of innovation, where customers are as important as producers as sources of innovation. In his article, The Dominant Role of Users in the Scientific Instrument Innovation Process, Hippel documented over 100 sources of the most important scientific and commercial innovations. He found that approximately 80% of those new products had been invented and field tested by the end user, that is, customers, rather than by a manufacturer. Later in 2003, Professor Henry Chesborough built on von Hippel's idea of user innovation, and he coined the term and popularized the term open innovation to describe the distributed process of working across organizational boundaries to accelerate innovation. So, if you want to take advantage of open innovation, you have to first decide what kind of collective intelligence you need. The practices of open innovation and collective intelligence can roughly be grouped into three different kinds of work. Crowdsourcing, collaboration, and co-creation. Crowdsourcing, a term that blends crowd and outsourcing, coined by journalist Jeff Howe in a 2005 eponymous book, defines crowdsourcing as, quote, the act of a company or institution taking a function once performed by employees and outsourcing it to an undefined and generally large network of people in the form of an open call. Many famous demonstrations involve a large audience of volunteers, guessing the number, for example, of jelly beans in a jar, and having the guesses averaged. With a large enough number of guesses, the average converges on the right number. There isn't much collaboration, however, among the participants. But today, crowdsourcing has come to refer to almost any kind of public engagement, regardless of how big the crowd is or how collaborative the project. Frequently, crowdsourcing comes in the form of a challenge or contest or competition, often that involves soliciting responses from a group of people and picking a winner. Contests work well when it's not obvious what combination of skills or even which technical approach will lead to the best outcome. For example, to devise solutions at the national level, federal agencies of the U.S. government have published over a thousand challenges on challenge.gov since 2010. To take one example, the Health Resources and Services Administration was able to launch a competition to address the word gap, 
that occurs for low-income children due to limited early exposure to language. HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau made $300,000 in prizes available to spur innovative solutions to promote early language development. The goal of the Word Gap Challenge was to identify existing technology and expertise to spur the development of low-cost, scalable, and technologically-based interventions that drive parents and caregivers to talk to and engage in more back-and-forth interactions with their young children. But prize-back crowdsourcing, where there is a search for one solution, is not the only way to take advantage of the wisdom of the crowd. And in fact, if you're seeking to leverage the crowd to better define your problem, or even to come up with solutions, may not even be the best way. What we call, or in this case, what we'll term collaboration, invites a shared product and inviting collaboration on a common project or goal. Collaboration works well when a community can be marshaled with a common vision, getting many hands on deck to develop something together. Wikipedia is a great example of what we're calling, in this case, collaboration. Finally, the crowd, however, can also be leveraged not to work on one solution, but to co-create many diverse responses to a question. In San Pedro Garza de Garcia in Mexico, the mayor's office and the city council have tapped the collective wisdom of residents to develop a series of solutions to urban challenges. Local Motors, founded in 2007, uses customer co-creation to design and manufacture new cars, coordinating the work of many people to develop a plethora of designs. The city of Lakewood, Colorado, to take another government example, makes up for lacking sustainability officials in their municipality by coordinating the expertise of its residents to co-create diverse strategies for improving sustainability in their community. They devise and act on the policies they develop with support from the city. Globally, the Building State Capability Program at Harvard, too, accelerates a step-by-step -step process for co-creating public problem solving that begins with identifying a problem that matters with those affected. For example, in an effort to discourage youth from being recruited into illicit activities in southern Colombia, the Harvard team provided the process framework for local officials and stakeholders to co-create problem definitions in order to ascertain why youth recruitment was taking place and then engage young people in coming up with diverse root causes to the problem. Okay, let's talk a bit about the value of using collective intelligence. There are many obvious benefits to using open innovation processes like crowdsourcing, collaboration, and co-creation in problem solving. When we turn to a larger community of people, whether from a different agency, from another sector like academia or business, or from our own community or around the globe, we are getting more hands on deck more insights and experiences, and more collective wisdom and action faster that can make it possible, for example, to identify a hard problem, to solve a hard problem. The diversity of people and perspectives can be very helpful, as can simply having more people working together to accomplish what is hard for you to do working alone. The crowdsourcing literature shows that when participants are asked to perform technical tasks, even regular people, when they're given specific instructions, their performance is equal to or better than the performance of experts. But these are just some of the reasons to prefer an open innovation approach. Now that we've outlined the different types of group work at the root of collective intelligence practices, let's look at how to design such a process. It's important to recognize that achieving the desired outcomes requires effective choreography. Keep in mind at the outset that crowdsourcing, collaboration, and co-creation are not always the right approach. Before turning to the crowd to define your problem or devise solutions, you need to design the process for doing so by creating a detailed plan with well-defined milestones that needs to address at least these six steps. First, we start by defining a clear and compelling goal and writing it down so it can be clearly articulated to others. What constitutes success? What outputs and outcomes are you seeking? Second, you need to define the audience you want to participate in your project, considering what input they can provide to help you better define or solve the problem. Do you need access to domain experts with detailed knowledge of a specific field? Or do you need to get better insight into the problem by getting input from people with the lived experience of it? Do you need to engage stakeholders in other agencies or in the wider public who may have important information? And are there eligibility criteria, such as age or location or other qualifications that will help you to target the people you most need to hear from? 
don't forget that you can use open innovation with your own colleagues across agencies, as well as with local residents and global citizens. The sky's the limit. In step three, you should consider what are the tasks you want people to undertake? What type of participation will elicit the input you need? Broadly speaking, tasks might include gathering ideas, as the National Health Service did in the UK when it asked patients to diagnose problems with the nation's healthcare authority. Collecting data, as the cities of Antwerp and Barcelona are doing when they distribute strawberry plants to residents and then ask them to use the plants as a way to gather data about air quality by testing the leaves over time. Many cities have 311 hotlines where people can complain about water leaks or potholes. This is a form of distributed data collection. Undertaking tasks is what TED does when it coordinates volunteers to translate its globally popular lectures into multiple languages, or Oxford University's Galaxy Zoo project does when it collaborates with NASA and then asks distributed volunteers to label pictures of galaxies taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in an effort to categorize those galaxies. Hackathons are another form of task-based open innovation. These are brief but intense efforts, running for a few hours or a few days, where participants gather to focus on a specific problem. Legal hackers, for example, run events like those with the justice system, uh, like, excuse me, like those that focus on working with justice system professionals to address problems in legal systems. Fourth is the act of sharing recommendations and opinions. The federal government solicits reactions to draft regulations prior to enactment via regulations.gov. Crowdfunding is another special case of people coordinating and collecting money rather than data or ideas. SpaceHive is a platform that helps local communities coordinate contributions to pay for things like renovating the park or starting a community garden. Note, you may have to chunk or break down the bigger task into smaller more discrete tasks. Thus, gathering data, analyzing data, visualizing data might usefully be separated because different people are good at each of these tasks. Whatever task you ask people to undertake, be sure that the people involved understand clearly what is being asked of them and have the capacity, tools, and know-how to participate. For example, when CityScan in Connecticut asked volunteers to collect data in the field, they equipped them with digital cameras and other state-of-the-art technology of the time and trained them in how to use that technology for collecting data. Okay, next we have to move on to step four, determine the incentives by assuming what will motivate people to contribute. What is it that they would like in exchange for performing the specific activity that's being asked of them? Incentives don't have to be financial. And in fact, research shows that intrinsic, or namely non-financial incentives, often work much better than cash prizes for motivating participation. New Jersey's Innovation Engine Challenge, for example, offers winners rewards that are more tailored to the goal of, cha of the challenge, such as the opportunity and resources to implement their project in practice. The reward system was designed on the hypothesis that offering more goal-oriented rewards will attract participation from the individuals who truly want to improve government operations. Incentives you can consider include knowledge building, asking people to contribute to a specific field of knowledge, skill development, that is helping people to build a range of useful skills where they're participating in the challenge, might be community building, asking people to contribute to a large project of common interest, Appeal to people's civic responsibility, encouraging people to do things that benefit the community and their fellow citizens. There's also public recognition, public recognition offering public acknowledgement and networking opportunities. Another incentive is competition, that is appealing to those who are enthused by being challenged with a tough problem. Making a difference, offering the satisfaction of seeing one's work implemented and, of course, in some cases, financial incentives. That is, offering people money, prizes, and free stuff is never a bad idea. It's important to understand your target audience so you can choose the combination of incentives that you believe will be most likely to motivate them to act or to engage. After thinking through potential motivations to participate, you want to then think about the communication technology or platform that will best enable participation. There are many to choose from. 
whether it's this is a crowdsourcing exercise, a collaboration, or a co-creation exercise. Your fifth step is then to determine how you will evaluate people's contributions. Using expert judges to verify the quality of submissions and decide which to pursue is often a good idea, especially when the submissions are less plentiful, and that way it's not an overwhelming workload for the experts. When selecting the best inputs is more reliant on technical know-how or knowledge than government can do for itself, then experts from outside are often a good idea. One can also ask the crowd itself to verify the quality of the activity performed by voting for the best choice or ranking submissions. This is common for e-petitioning or proposal submission platforms, such as the New Jersey Innovation Engine Challenge, where for the first stage of that challenge, participants themselves rated the top ideas submitted by simply liking the proposals. The method works best for open innovation processes where the volume of proposals or ideas and the number of participants are both high, and when maintaining transparency, participation, and representativeness is crucial. A third approach is to create a peer review mechanism where a self-selected group of peers verify the quality of the activity performed, similar to the way Wikipedia users and editors maintain the quality of the crowdsourced content on the site. One approach involves what we might call a double verification process, in which if you're asking the crowd or a group of volunteer peer reviewers to classify an image, for example, the response is not officially recorded until a minimum number of other people give the same response. This is a useful method when you want to ensure that the quality of contributions is high and when the outputs are critical, such as in an open innovation project where the decisions are binding. For seeking supporting evidence is another approach you might take. For example, requiring people to upload a picture that verifies their submission or other data that backs up what they're claiming or asserting is another great way to verify the submissions. Whichever method you use, it's a good practice to be clear and upfront about who will decide and the criteria for assessment. The last thing you want to do is to have evaluators picking the most novel proposals when what you actually want are the most feasible ones. Just as important, being transparent about how you will assess and use contributions builds trust in your process and enables people to provide you with better quality inputs. Okay, once you have the design finalized, it's time to create a timeline for the exercise and then to launch it. Creating a detailed plan, including dates and responsibilities and sticking to it is crucial. You're going to want to determine what needs to be done prior to launch and how long that period will take, how long the actual exercise will be open for participation, how long the results will take to analyze and publish, who will support and organize the process, and who will implement and use the outputs. Of course, you have to decide what platform will be used to undertake this activity. And in addition, in most cases, whether you're trying to attract participation from a broader audience or you simply want to promote the work you're doing, it's ideal to have a communication strategy throughout the process to share your work and to make sure people learn about the opportunity to participate. This can include, but it's not limited to, things like posting on social media, engaging and asking key stakeholders to amplify, contacting partners, contacting publications, distributing information via mailing lists, Although the benefits of open innovation processes are many, there are still a number of common pitfalls. Those include, first, using open innovation at the wrong time. Open innovation definitely works better where the needed insight and wisdom are widely distributed, where you're able to define a target audience that holds the expertise you need, and where a process for acquiring and selecting the best inputs can be easily described but it's not always the right mechanism, and you have to be convinced that this kind of open listening is really what you want to do. Second, it's the failure to motivate the right audience to participate in the right way. Unless you have a strategy for getting your intended audience involved, they often don't. For example, research on Rava Kogu, an Austri Estonian initiative, which aimed to engage the general public in a process of crowdsourcing proposals to reform the country's political financing system, found that a disproportionately large number of participants were middle-aged, wealthy males with a higher level of education, potentially skewing the nature and range of proposals. Not enough investment was made in attracting diverse participants at the outset. Okay, pitfall three. You have the input, but now you're not sure what to do with it. Too often, open innovation efforts are launched into the world without a clear strategy for using the input received. 
Not only does this lead to wasting government resources on open innovation efforts that don't yield any tangible benefit, it can discourage people from wanting to participate in future efforts and decrease trust in government. So why participate if no one is going to act on my input is a very real question people ask themselves. But when designed well and executed properly, using collective intelligence in an efficient and effective way to tap into the wisdom, expertise, and lived experience of the crowd, with an array of new technologies available for government to use, it is easier now than ever before to extract useful insights and contributions from people who have traditionally gone unheard and who have a lot to say, both about how to define and how to solve public problems.